that's better. Now we're in landscape mode. <laughs> Say hello. 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 <laughs> I didn't put any earrings in, I just noticed. <laughs> so it is rainy here, and apparently it's rain in the UK. I don't know about you, yesterday it was like 27 degrees and it was like hot, hot, hot. And I got another like sunburn again. Was it hot yesterday for you? Here, no, it wasn't. It's not, it's not been that hot, hot. It's been, it's, it's warm. It's been quite humid. Even when it's been like raining. Yeah, it was, it was really hot yesterday. And I was in like a strappy top and shorts. And now today I'm having to wear a long top and shorts because it's got, and I've got the heating on. Can you believe I've got the heating on? Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. It's cold. <laughs> I like being it's snug. Cold. <laughs> no. Is it? It's not cold in your house. I'm always, I'm always like that though. I like to walk around in like a little, like little shorts and little t-shirt and I've the heating on and he all goes mad. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, just put bloody jumper on. Put it, that's what he says. Put a jump, put something else on. Put some warmer on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we are going to talk about um, history of quilt patterns, and I've got the resource from a, a website called woman woman folk dot com. Woman folk. How do you pronounce that? F O L K folk, like folk music. Folk, folk, yeah, folk. <clears throat> Tell you, I've got a problem with like F's and T H's. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say three, and I can't say thread. So every time I do, <laughs> every time I do a YouTube tutorial, and I say the word thread, and I'm I'm doing my like close captionings on my like videos and that, so I'm inclusive to like people that can't, you know, um, they want to like read along and stuff. Even like people like to read along anyway, like if they're in the office or something, like to have the sound off and that. And um, every time I say the word thread, well, I don't say the thread. I got I always go thread. <laughs> it says thread. F R E D. <laughs> Fred. <laughs> what, what I like about that actually is that ever since I've been doing like YouTube videos I've noticed some of my words that I say and I don't say them properly and it's helped me to like try and you know pronunciate them a bit better than what I normally do yeah. and it's funny because when you watch my videos I notice that I say certain words a hell of a lot like I always say one of the words I always say is literally, uh, literally, literally, <laughs> literally. And then there'd be another word that I'm always saying, I always go, like, at the beginning, like, because I'll film something, I'll, I'll cut it off, and I'll film something again, I'll cut it off. And then I always start, <laughs> and I always go, so, so. <laughs> I think we all have our words, I think mine's really... But it's so irritating, like when you watch yourself back and you're doing these videos and stuff and you're going like, so, so, <laughs> Cassie. <laughs> I don't know if I can edit it out. I like try to edit it out, but it's, it's kind of hilarious. Anyway, <laughs> hello to the people that are joining us. Hi there. Hello. My mum has told me, Cassie, you need to keep watching the screen and you need to like make sure that nobody's asking questions or if anybody said anything. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on the screen as well. I'm going to read a paragraph and look at the screen. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got my resource today from womenfolk.com and I'll put the link in the description. So the first, the first quilt block that the, I'm going to talk about is a biscuit quilt. And it says the name of a biscuit quilt brings to mind the time, old time comfort of walking into a warm quilt, walking, walking into, 
walking under a warm quilt to the smell of biscuits baking in the oven. The biscuits, the biscuits in the oven may have been a true delight, but there are those who would question the comfort of a biscuit quilt. I don't even know what a biscuit quilt is, if I'm honest, but I guess I'm going to find out. Biscuit quilts, comfy or not. So these quilts called both biscuit and puff quilts. So it's one that you made. Yeah. However, it doesn't oh, look like okay. the one that you made. Yours is much better than the one that I sent a picture of. Because it doesn't yeah. look puffy in this picture that I'm looking at. Because a puff quilt, how many layers did you put in between? Layers? I didn't. I just I filled it with that. Too. The polyfill, didn't you? <laughs> well, that, that stuff. You haven't what got you COVID. Have you got COVID? <laughs> I'm joking. That is the word we're not allowed to say. <laughs> no, I'm, Are you okay I'm over there? Wow. <laughs> yeah, I was lying down. Do you know what you, you bloody slide? I think I've gone and swallowed it and went down the way. <laughs> swallowed your saliva and it went down the way. <laughs> so, oh, goodness me. You stuffed it with what? Your saliva? That. <laughs> well, that stuff you put. It was like it, it was like a, what's that stuff you call that you put in? You fill like with teddy bears and stuff. polyfill. Yeah, that stuff. It was expensive. That it wasn't too bad where I got mine from. Did you find it at a cheap yeah. shop? Like, I think I can find, I, do I normally buy it from Walmart? I think I got it from Walmart when I bought some. Got a great big bag. I got, from, got it from um, Blackburn Market. Then I, got, I got one lot from Blackburn Market and I got another lot from that Abican. I don't even know what that place is. You mentioned places I don't <laughs> even know. It was, it, it's, it was near where, do you remember where um, Sharks were? Is well, it's not there no more. Who? Where? Sharp. Was it Sharps? Um, um, what's, what's it? Sharps? Sharps? Staples, I mean, sorry. Staples. <laughs> Sharps. Sharps. Got that bloody stupid thing, flat place on the mind or something. Because we were talking about it before, I was talking to even my colleagues with it before about Sharps. <clears throat> No, it was a that was this near, near Staples is gonna be expensive. Staples. They know staples so polyfill. Seriously? No, no, it was no, it was near. Oh, okay. It was near there. Okay. Over the road from there. So yeah, anyway, what did they fill did they fill it with was something? I hope they do. So here it says, um, quilts called both biscuits and puff quilts are made with individually stuffed squares sewn together to make up the whole quilt. So if you are sleeping under one, you are sleeping under dozens of square, squarish puff balls. Okay. Today, the lightweight polyester filling found at craft stores can result in a light, comfy quilt. But in the 19th century, these quilts filled with cotton or wool were not always so comfortable. Worst of all, in the 20th century, biscuit quilts stuffed with discarded nylon stockings <laughs> resulted in truly heavy, lumpy quilts. I hope they washed them. <laughs> I should imagine so, yeah. But I've done that before now, you know, cut up tights mm -hmm. and stuff things with tights. I know, I think like a lot of people will, they'll probably like stuff with like leftover fabrics and stuff, won't they? Well, yeah. Well, back then they wouldn't the, have had polyfill. The scraps are the scraps kind of thing, you know, the bits you won't be able to use, you chop them up a bit more and chip them out. So then the Victorian biscuit and all puff quilts. Biscuit or puff quilts have been, have been around for some time and were popular during the Victorian era. These Victorian puff quilts may have been more decorative than utilitarian. See, my pronunciation again. It's going to be the running theme of all of this show. Um, 
<laughs> as many were made smaller than what would have been needed for a bed covering. Quilt historian Barbara Brackman notes a biscuit quilt pattern published in the, the Ohio Farmer in 1896. She also lists the same pattern by the name of Swish, Swiss Pat, Pat, Swish Pat, oh my word, that's a tongue tie, tie there. Swiss patchwork and raised patchwork with the date of 1882. This style quilt may have been made earlier, but these were the earliest known published dates. <clears throat> Breckman also wrote the following her newsletter. Puff quilts are generally done in satins and velvets and were popular at the end of the 19th century. The technique was also quite the fashion for sofa pillows. She added, puff or biscuit quilts, especially those made of silk, tend to be from the golden age of silk show quilts, 1880 and 1900s. So, so, I think, so thought to, so, I can't even, I've tongue-tied today. <clears throat> they may seem to be a bit clumsy to us. They were considered quite elegant at one time. So these quilts were made out of silk. Oh, and that would have been heavy then, that wouldn't it? Did I say velvet? Did I say did I say velvet or just silk? Silk, I think. I thought there was another fabric that I mentioned. It does. It just says silk. Hi, Jill. Oh, Jill's back. Hi, Jill. Oh, hello, Jill. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> Um, biscuit quilts in the 1970s. To the right of the example of the front and back are two-sided 1970 biscuit quilts. It is interesting how the maker put a sash in between the squares on the front only. I actually quite like that. Like it's a square, it's a square block and they've got like a, what a sashing is, well what I think a sashing, let me have a look what a sashing actually is because I think a sashing is just a border. But I don't understand the difference between what's the difference between a sash and a border. Can I find it really quick? <clears throat> I honestly think they're just the same thing. So a sash is just basically a border around each of the squares. So it was kind of cute. It's only like a thin, thin thing yeah. in between. It just adds a little bit of detail. And the sash in between these are like all the same colour. Like it's just like light pink. <clears throat> yeah, I can see that. <clears throat> um, as mentioned above, these quilts made a great comeback in the 1970s when recycling and getting back to the earth was in vogue. It was only natural that women reused nylons to stuff the pillows that made up the biscuit quilt. Mm. <clears throat> so the influence of Jonathan Holston, possibly for reasons stated above, puff or biscuit quilts were never quite the rage that styles like crazy quilts were. But Jonathan Holston loved looking for quilts that were striking and sometimes unusual. So is that, is that why you decided to do it? Because they're know, unusual. I, I think I did it because I thought it was going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what, was it easy? Do you think it was easier? Yeah, I think it was easier, yeah. But it was a bit tricky getting, do you know when you, when you filled all the pockets up? Because mm -hmm. I put quite, the one that I did was, you know, you had to put quite a bit of stuff in to puff it up because it looks like um, a ravioli, basically. Because you make one square, like say it's a five inch square, and then you do a four inch square, and the five inch square you sort of like pleat it slightly, and then, you know, run it through the machine, and you do it on all sides like that. Just pleat ple a, a slight little bit. And go away when you fill it, then you, you pleat it, then you know, like fill it all up. So you've got all these little squares. Then you start attaching them all together. But it's, it's when you start getting a load of them, you know, when you've got like a, you, you've, you've done a section of rows, 
and you get that rolled and you're having to put it through the machine. It, that's when it gets a bit, um, you know, having to catch it all. Yeah. Kind of thing. Sometimes I get the polyfill in between the, the seam. And there's like a little bit of polyfill sticking out. That's what I mean. So when you're filling it up, it's like basically trying to make sure you've got, you know, it's all filled in. You know, you've got it all pushed in properly. Well, you no, know, you fill it, you, you do the you, that you three side, then you put your filler in, then you do the, it's just the part that you, it's the last part really that you've got to make sure you don't, you know, get it trapped. And I got, it was easy really. I just found I just struggled with the uh, the you know the binding. I don't not done I've never done binding before. Well, the more that you do binding, the easier it gets. Yeah, I made the I made the actual um, length of it. We're just getting it attached to the thing, and I probably did like three sides. Okay, it was a full side, and I just couldn't. I just. I don't know. I was. I was. I don't know. If I was tired or what it was, and I left it. And I came back to it, did sewed it up, and it, I thought it doesn't look right. And I had to unpick it again, and I had to leave it, and come back to it again another time. <laughs> and it, I just couldn't get the last bit for some reason. It was just really odd. It's very frustrating. <clears throat> yeah. Um. Has anybody asked any questions? <laughs> no, they haven't. They're very quiet. Holston was the quilt collector who renewed the interest in quilting during the 1970s through the exhibition Abstract Design in American Quilts. It was the first shown in 1971 at the Whitney Museum of the American Arts in New York. Before this exhibition, position most people had not considered ordinary quilting as even possibly being art but the exhibition changed all that it was so popular it soon traveled overseas and around the united states so this is one of the things i think because we were talking about this last week about how expensive these quilts are and stuff when you actually do make them i think they are more art than they are like um you know, for just putting them on your bed. I think quilts should be seen as being mm -hmm. artwork. Like wall art. Pretty much, yeah. Because mm -hmm. like, see, I don't want to criticise some paintings, but you look at some paintings and you think I could have done better. <laughs> Let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. And, you know, they go for thousands and thousands of dollars. And then you've got these quilts that are basically should be worth when these women do make them, some of these quilts should be worth $2,000, if not more. And I think if they were more accepted as artwork, you could get a lot more money out of it and people could make a business out of it much better. Maybe yeah. I should push for that. Yeah, I'm going to push. There's a lot more than what they, they do get sold for because it's, it's not just the material. And um, you know the fabric and everything. It's the design that's gone into it. You know, I mean, it's it's, the, it's like when someone buys a car, isn't it? You, you, it's all the materials and everything, the design work, and you know, like all all, all the rest of that kind of thing. I know. You know, and these are very un underestimated, aren't they? Um, really, aren't they? These. Well, especially when you go into like more fabric art and you go into like applique, like that one that Susan did, like of her son and that, like that's artwork that, <clears throat> that's not just like just sewing blocks together, like when you've actually created a picture and like applique and stuff is definitely artwork. Oh God, yeah, yeah it is. And it's, it's like, it's not just like the hours in it, it's all the man hours that go into it. Yeah, well. yeah. Because you could, you argue the same thing, like when it's like, a, you know, when you're doing a portrait of somebody, that's, you know, and then you've, you've gone to all that extent to actually create something out of fabric that is just a picture of something, like a landscape, some amazing stuff. It is, <clears throat> yes. I actually took a picture on my walk. I went to the woods again yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And um, I was out walking and I saw 
there was like a, it's like a, a wooden gate and like some steps leading up to the gate and like foliage around it and I said you know what that would make a really nice quilt so I took a photograph of it because I'm going to turn it into some like a little and here you go mom I'm going to turn it into a little quilt <laughs> 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 do you reckon I could get it on some, like, one of my mug rugs? Do you know, like, a small mug rug thing? Do you reckon I could do it to that size? Maybe that should be my challenge. I have to do my little wall hanging thing to the size of my little mug rug. It'll end up being like, um, <laughs> something like um, a, um, a table mat or a table rug. <laughs> Because I can't stop like building off them. <laughs> anyway, so you might be amused to read that Jonathan Holston had to say about the puff quilt including concluded in this exhibition. This is another manis manis this is another manifestation of the late Victorian novelty textile cult. Huh? He called it a textile cult. <laughs> If it were not so silly looking, it might be taken more seriously as an aesthetic object. These quilts are also surprisingly impractical, far too heavy to sleep under comfortably. What could they have been used for? Maybe you lay on them for some therapeutic effect rather than under them for slumber. I have tried them both ways and they are equally uncomfortable. But how curious and wonderful is the surface of this particular object? For somebody who likes to like do it, doesn't have much love for it. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Actually, but there is a thing about weighted quilts in therapy, though, isn't there? Have you heard of weighted oh, no. quilts? I haven't. No, I was on the Weighted quilts, yeah, I'm sure other people have. Have you heard of a weighted quilt? So a weighted quilt. <clears throat> what is a weighted quilt? Weighted blankets are exactly what they sound like. They're heavy blankets, typically 15 pounds or more, filled with a material such as plastic pellets. The therapy is that the deep pressure you feel from being under all of that weight has a calming effect. See, I don't need a weighted quilt because I've got Gatsby. <laughs> <laughs> Gatsby's my cat. <laughs> and he likes to lay on his mummy. Why does he think that they're not very comfortable? <clears throat> what was the one that you did? Was it okay? I don't know because I only made, I only made it small. <laughs> I didn't make it for me. I made it for my friend because she's pregnant and that it was just a gesture for, um, it was just a gesture really. But should the baby can lie on it comfortably, can't it? I think it'd be okay like for, you know, like a, uh, a decoration pocket something. Oh, that would look so cute in the pram. Yeah, yeah, it would. You should have done a frill around the edges of it. I had a trouble getting the plumbing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna admit, you always tell me what I should and shouldn't do on all my stuff, so I'm starting on you now. Yeah, but you're all right. You know what you're doing. <laughs> it's not that it's difficult. difficult. What was my first one that, wasn't it? I've not done one before. So, no, but you still had to push it right side through, though, didn't you? Because that's what I was struggling with at first. So you, you, what you did was you did your foot and your back on your puff, puff quilt, and you still did the backing, didn't you, on it? So you still had an inside lining. So what you could have done was, like, pulled it up, I know how you could have put a frill on it really easily. <laughs> You'll have to do a second one, I'll have to show you. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, when you can actually come over here and fly on a plane, that would be nice. That would, yeah. <laughs> so, um, a puff style quilts don't have to be made of stuffed squares. Bracken listed a diamond shaped puff quilt 
from 1882, apparently a variation on the raised patchwork and Swiss, Swiss patchwork I mentioned above. Sometimes biscuits or puff quilts were made up of a variety of fabrics sewn together at random. Other times they were put in a pattern like the around the world or log cabin arrangements. The fabrics varied too. They might have been made from fine velvet. See, I told you I said velvet. Fine oh. velvets or of wool suiting or is it gabardine? Gabardine. What's that? Gabardine. Gabardine's like what you make out of bloody oh, raincoats in there. Really? Now I have to search it again. <clears throat> oh, I'm getting comments. Oh, I'm getting excited. <laughs> <laughs> Jill says hello yeah. to you. Hello to you and your mum. Because nobody knows your name. <laughs> I just call you mum. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hello, Jill. Um, so she agrees with the applicator's artwork, which I totally agree. It should be seen as artwork. Um, mm -hmm. Fabric is the canvas and thread of... Oh, fabric is the canvas and thread is the paint. That is so true. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hello. I've got somebody new here. Butterfly on my wall. Doesn't that sound cute? Butterfly on my oh. wall. That's what they're called. Um, hi there. Another one from Texas. Hello. I've got so many Texas people here. What's going on? Um, Jill, yeah. Everybody from Texas. I like that. Oh, Roberta's here. Hi, Roberta. Yay. Oh, hello. Hello. All of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what I was searching. I got sidetracked. Gabardine. Gabardine. What's Gabardine, everybody? Does it ra know? Okay, it's yeah, this is a quiz. What's Gabardine? What is Gabardine? I hope I'm it's saying that right. Am I saying that right? G-A-B-A-R-D-I-N-E. I, -E. I want to know, do you know what Gabardine is? Because I have no idea. Have a look. Gabardine? Gabardine. Are we just going to keep saying Gabardine? <laughs> Does Jill or oh, um, anybody know? I'm waiting for them to write. <clears throat> I can give you a few seconds here. I see what it is now. What did you say it was, Mum? It was these fabric uh, that you make out of coats, isn't it? What kind of coat, though? A raincoat. It's not a raincoat fabric, no. Oh, is wait a minute. Not? I'll tell you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here you go. Jill says I've made pants with gabardine. Yeah. Okay, so gabardine, any any of several varieties of worsened cotton, silk, or mixed tightly woven fabrics embodied certain features in commonly and chiefly made into suits and overcoats. It is relatively strong and firm cloth made with a twill weave and somewhat resembling whip cord, but a lighter texture. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's like, it is, it's pant material, pants. Your pants. <laughs> <laughs> That's not nice, you just said it was pants. <laughs> It's quite a heavy fabric, that, isn't it, for um, a quilt? Oh, uh, so a butterfly on my wall just said, my, friend, my friends often say, said that they wish there could be a fly on my wall, hence my name, butterfly on my wall. Aww. Aww. So why, nice. now, now that's another question, why are your friends saying that? Why exactly? <laughs> I want the gossip on this. 
Is this is this a good thing? Do you know what you say? Oh, I wish I was a fly on the wall for that situation. <laughs> That's too funny. Just it's suitor material. Yes, it is suitor material. I think yeah. it's a bit heavier fabric. It is. Okay. But I've used twill. I've used twill in order to make bags with sometimes. Yeah, it's quite heavy, isn't it? It's nice. It's like a nicer weight of cotton, really. Yeah, I have used it too. Okay, so that is that with the puff quilt. Let's go on to my next one. So if you don't know what I'm doing, and I generally don't know what I'm doing anyway, I just go with the flow. <laughs> I've um, gone onto this website called woman, womanfolk.com and I've put the description, the details in the description of this video and I'm just reading some of the history of some of our quilt patterns. So that was the puff quilt, the biscuit quilt and now I'm going to read the, the bear, the bear paw. I always think of Gatsby, I always call him bear. <laughs> I don't know why I call my cat bear, he's a cat, not a bear. <laughs> have you seen that pattern mum <clears throat> yes i can see that yeah oh i are you sure i actually think the butterfly on my wall is my mum really do you know what she said about a fly on the wall <laughs> 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 she just said i think they think i'm special inverted commas I dance to the beat of my own drum. That just sounds like you. <laughs> <laughs> I like you. I like her. You can come every, yes. every single Sunday. Come every single Sunday. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so bear paw. Have you seen the picture, Mum? Yeah. I mean, it's all it's literally just half square triangles it's funny because when i was when i was new to quilting i would like literally have to get like patterns well i never did get patterns i actually tell a lie there <laughs> but I, I got some books i got books and because i could never decide that like how to make like certain quilts and stuff but now i can look at pictures and think no that's that's half square triangles and that's squares like some of these patterns aren't really that difficult to understand the only thing that you need to understand is when you're making a half square triangle you have to take away that quarter of um you have a quarter of a seam allowance that you have to take away because when you do obviously when you just do a square block that's just a square block hey eh? but when you do like if say if you're doing a four inch if you if you're trying to marry like a half square triangle with a regular square you obviously have to make it bigger to allow for the you know the um the seam allowances. So mm -hmm. I think you have to make it like half an inch bigger than like your squares. So if you have a four inch square, you would have to make four and a half inches of your half square triangle in order for it to shrink down into the same square as what the other one is. But actually it's easier to actually do anyway. Even if you made an, over, an oversized half square triangle, you can actually cut it with your ruler anyway. Because you're on your ruler, do you, you've bought clothes and rulers, haven't you, Mum? <clears throat> no. No? I've only, I've only got, no, I, I've only got one <clears throat> ruler that I've got, that physically bought. That's, um, it's like a bit more than oblong. Well, when you buy your quilting rulers, they always come with, like, the degrees on your <clears throat> rulers. <clears throat> I'm going to show everybody. I mean, most of these people know anyway because they're quilters. But on that um, diagonal cut, so if you made like a half square triangle and you wanted to make it smaller, you can make it smaller anyway using that diagonal. So you just line it up to where you want it to be and then just cut the excess off. These rulers are actually, um, when I first bought these rulers and I just used it just to measure out like the quarter, like the, the one inch and da 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 da. But they actually have, like, with these diagonal lines and that, they're so versatile. I really, um, I underuse some of my rulers, really. Mm -hmm. I went on a tangent then, didn't I? 
<laughs> I got excited. <laughs> I always get excited about things sometimes. It's like I've learned oh, something. Yeah. I've learned something on my sewing machine. Quick, let's show everybody. <laughs> Okay, the bear paw. Oh, that's nice and excited about stuff, isn't it? It is. I think she said something else. Um... Oh, she says, Mum and I need to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds good. So it's funny, um, not many people ask me this question, but somebody's saying, what does Feridel mean? Can you remember? What it, no, actually, I'm not going to ask you because I want you to. But I'll just I was tell the story of what a feridal actually meant. So when I was creating my business, I wanted to create a name for my company. Like I don't, I didn't want it to go by my actual name of Cassie Cartmel. I wanted it to have a business name because I didn't want my business to be my name of my business, and I wanted, I wanted to have a name. Some it's, it was, I wanted something sewing related at first and when I went on to like I was like looking at things like seamlessly and like you know all the like play on words with like sewing like and most of the like really good ones like the like, really good ones were like all taken so I was like okay then I need something a little bit different so I just started and I love meanings and stuff like Joe when somebody creates a business it's got a meaning behind it what do you think mum? Yeah, it, it, I think it sounds a bit better, doesn't it? Well, the only thing mm -hmm. is, is that my husband was there like, why did you create a business where it was, it's quite hard for people to remember how to spell it? And that is one of the problems with the word Isle because you kind of like, even like when I first called it Isle, like I struggled to remember how to spell my own business name too. <laughs> <laughs> But it's Gaelic. The word of Feridal is Gaelic and it I'm I'm not Gaelic, I'm actually English, as you can tell. Um but the word actually means a lucky find. I like that, it's a nice little quirky name, isn't it? It is a nice so I thought, okay then, I like so it's it's a lucky find creation. So that's what Feridal means, a lucky find. So like I'm like a it's like a diamond in a rough. I'm I'm just this lucky find that you found me. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I mean, I like I like explaining why I called it Feridale. I like it. Mm. It's, it's really good. It's different. It's unusual. And the thing it's that different. one thing that I really like about it is well, there's wasn't that many Feridales like anywhere anyway, and there wasn't. I think there's only, like, when you search the word Feridale on YouTube, it um, pops up some music group. And yet, if you, I'm going to actually advertise them because they're, when you search Feridale, just Feridale, not the creation, it, it searches up this, like, music group and it's very kind of, like, calming and, like, peaceful music. Like, Mum, you need to, like, listen to some of their stuff. I should approach them. I should approach Feridale and say, hey, would you like to do a song for me? <laughs> Oh, and pay them and then use that in my YouTube videos. But yet again, people have complained in the past because when I did my first YouTube videos, I used to hate the sound of my own voice and I always used to put music in the background of them. And it's funny because as people are going back and watching, or some of them are getting really popular now, um, and people are like watching them, that's one of the things that they complain about is the music. <laughs> It is, it is annoying, I think, when you've got music in the background, you, you, you know, you're trying to listen to, you're trying to focus on what you're trying to, the person's trying to say, and, you know, you know, if you're talking to someone, you've got this music at the back of you, you might think it's okay, but other people might, I, I found, I found that with some, that I looked at, you know, previously, and I found it quite annoying. But I think the reason why creators add the music in the background is because they think that it makes their channel look like more professional, like because yeah, it's got music in the background of it. But it is, it's kind of off-putting, especially when you're like a, a tutorial type 
And I, oh, I thought, oh, you know, I've got a bit of white noise and I've got to fill that white noise with something. And I can't just have that, like, where nobody's speaking or nobody's saying anything. So that's where, I, like, the music came in. So when I was doing a part of, like, just me sewing, it would have, like, music in the background rather than, like, the, the machine going, do 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 you know what I mean? But now it doesn't even bother me. Like... And plus, I've got a load of, like, monetization issues coming up now because even though they weren't copyright-free... It was copyright-free music for me to use, but, however, they've taken that money away from me because I've used that their stuff. So there's a few videos that I can never monetize on now because their music is on my stuff. Oh. I know. Anyway, so... It doesn't matter because I don't use music anymore and I'm really careful not to. <laughs> and um, it doesn't, it doesn't add anything. I'm quite, and I like the sound of my own voice now. <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> so Butterfly My World just said, oh, very nice. I often wondered like what the word Feridal meant. Thank you. Indeed a lucky find. I do enjoy your channel. Well, thank you very much. That's nice. Oh, nice. It is, isn't it? It's funny because I'm starting to see a lot more people like subscribing to my channel now. It's been a long time coming. Like I've done this channel for quite a long time, and it's it's nice. That I enjoy that I have like you guys like um, subscribing to me. Don't get don't get me wrong. I never want to appear ungrateful for anybody's subscriptions, but it's nice to get the validation of your channel that, you know, more people are subscribed into my channel. So I'm, I'm really appreciate that. <clears throat> so let's talk about the bear paw. Let's get into some fun stuff. Let's try and start laughing again. Um, what, what became each claw in the bear paw quilt block has its beginnings as the sawtooth border used on early American quilts. So the, the early sawtooth borders, the story of this pattern begins even before pieced quilts became common around the middle of the 19th century. Early American quilts are often in a medallion style with several borders surrounding a central area of an interesting printed fabric or solid with a larger motif applique on it. Historian Sandy Fox remarks, no other border was applied with greater ingenuity and diversity than the sawtooth. It would be applied in one of three methods to a perfect turn and direction, but is, it is in its, least, in its less precise application that it's often assumed its greatest charm. Borders like this continue to be popular when quilts were more often made of a set of pieced blocks. You can see an example of the sawtooth border in this reproduction log cabin doll quilt to the left. Oh, we're back to dolls again. <laughs> Maybe that's what I should do. My quilts need to be dolly sized. Maybe that should help. <laughs> <laughs> So some of you said, when I first bought my Soprano, I found your channel. It was very helpful. Thank you very much. And Jill said, that is also how I found your channel. I was looking for, for tutorials for the Soprano. Thank you. Hi. I found your channel when I got my Tiara free and you gave me some advice. I know when I haven't done that many um, videos on the Tiara free. I've literally done how to wind the bobbin, how to thread it. And I think I did something on just like free motion quilting, but I've not done that many on the Tiara Free. So if you've got any recommendations on what you would like to see on the Tiara Free, let me know and I'll get some done because I need to do more on the Tiara Free. So that's my mid arm one. That's good. <clears throat> Okie dokie. So the sawtooth saw block patterns, of course the methods used to piece a border could easily be adapted to a quilt block. Quilt historian Barbara Brackman wrote, the sawtooth block appears in many early 19th century quilts arranged, 
arranged first in strips for borders and later as blocks. The earliest date inscribed version is dated 1823. <clears throat> These triangle shaped sortive were used in many patterns, including sawtooth stars and diamonds. Possibly the most delightful pattern related to the sawtooth is the ever popular boar's paw. Boar's? Boar's paw? <laughs> it's a bear. It's a bear paw. <laughs> well, that's too funny. Oh, look at that. That's interesting. Vari varied paw blocks. It looks like a pin, it's a pinwheel. Rarely does, oh. rarely does a quilt pattern have just one name, and often a quilt name is given to more than one pattern. So in the case of a bear's paw, we find it related to different ones by the same name. In one unexpected version of, of the paws appear to be walking in a circle. Oh, okay, I see it. Okay, I thought it was a pinwheel, but I see it's the, it's, it's the paws walking in a circle. Okay. Um, it is also known as Delectable Mountains, Indian Trail, North Wind, and Irish Puzzle. Each of these names also apply to one or more other patterns. Can you see what a muddle pattern names can be? Oh, okay. Can you see what a muddle pattern names can be? Okay, because it can... No, I'm not going to... So they're basically saying that there's like different names for the same quilt block. But I can see right. the, the paws walking in a circle. I can't take a picture because I'm filming with that camera. <clears throat> I'll take a picture later. Oh, you're looking at something different, right. <laughs> <laughs> you're kind of a bit muddled up then. Because <laughs> I think I only took a photograph for you of just the bear paw, like the four of them. There's just four of them yeah. with a square in the middle. Now there's another one. Another one that was. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I totally confused you. You're like, why is it walking in a circle? I know. <laughs> I should have kept on going. <laughs> I should have kept on going and just said, "It's there. Can you not see it?" <laughs> <laughs> oh god, that's so funny. <laughs> the regional names for this block. The pattern is mo. The pattern that most quilters recognise as the bear paw is one with four paws, each pointed in different directions, like the example to the right above. But, of course, even this has several names. Now, I need to make sure that you look at the one that... Okay, yeah. So, the, the one that... Yeah, it's kind of the same, almost. <laughs> Early 20th century writer Ruth Finley was sometimes as much of a storyteller as she is a quilt historian. After telling a great story about bears and romance, she wrote, there are as many good bear stories in Ohio as there are bears poor quilts made before 1850. She goes on to tell the story of how a friend phoned one day and said, why do I feel as I'm going to start bursting to laughter in a minute? <laughs> So a friend phoned her up one day to say she has a quilt poplar in Long Island called Duck's Foot in the Mud. Finley quickly arranged a time, arranged a time when she could go see this quilt, only to find it was the very same pattern as Ohio's favourite, the bear's paw. Her first impulse was to disagree on the name of the quilt, but her friend pointed out that the are more ducks on Long Island than bears in Ohio. Oh goodness. Everybody's gonna fight over the names of the quilts. <laughs> One's gonna go, it's a duck, the other one's gonna say it's a bear. <laughs> Soon after a friend from Philadelphia saw Finley's bear paw quilt and exclaimed, Oh, you've got a yellow and white hand of friendship. 
mine's blue and white, it seems appropriate that the block would be called Hand of Friendship by the Quakers in, Phil in Philadelphia, as well as Duck's Foot in the Mud by folks who lived in the coast with ducks all around. Actually, this is a wonderful example of how many quilt names are regional. I wonder what <laughs> some of the other names for this pattern, like tea leaf design and... See, no, I was going to say this, it's totally took it out of my mouth. I'm upset <laughs> now. <laughs> That's why I was giggling, I was going to turn around and say, no, it's cat paws. <laughs> 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 and then somebody took it the right the right um so it's like passing like tea leaf design and cat's paws originated. I think I know where the name Illinois Turkey Track came from. Oh my goodness. Oh god. <laughs> <laughs> Why do I find that so funny? I'm just <laughs> I'm so easily <laughs> amused. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time I was getting giddy and giddy and giddy, and I was gonna well, like, I'm gonna call it cat paw. I'm gonna call it cat paw. Like, and then someone beat me to it. I'm so upset. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lordy. <sighs> um, what is the charm of free? The charm of free is a mid arm by Baby Lock. It's like, it's a sit down mid arm machine where you can do free motion quilting on. <clears throat> um, okay, I was just making sure that I wasn't missing any questions or anything while I was like giggling about bloody cat paws. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I started crying for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, so everybody was having an argument about what this particular <clears throat> um, design was all about. Well, I don't think it was an argument. They were just saying that in different regions, it's called different things. Yeah. I don't know what would it be called in England. Fox paws. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I burped. Actually, to me, it looks like a bit of an arrow. It's the, um, so the paw effect is the, you know, the spiky bits. So they're the claws. Mm, I know, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to say? It doesn't look like a paw. If you want it to actually look like a paw, it would have to be applique, wouldn't it? Because mm. mm -hmm. it's hard to do circles quilted. That's why a lot of things you see pointed on a quilt. Yeah, I know, yeah, because of the lines and that. Now you can do, like, I have done the drum cards path, um, and I do have a ruler that makes another curve as well that I've done. So that's why I wanted to get into chapters, because sometimes when they sell these magazines, they come with free rulers. There's a great <clears throat> way of getting a ruler that's inexpensive when you buy like the quilting magazines. Does anybody else do that? Like just buy the magazine just to get the free ruler. <laughs> <laughs> and literally that is it's all about the magazine file. Like look at the magazines and be like, okay, what's coming for free in these? Like, cause like <laughs> I totally missed out on my calendar this year. Like my sewing calendar. Like I don't have a sewing yeah. calendar now. <clears throat> Not that I'd used it, it was just, it was a nice kind of vintage looking sewing yeah, calendar, yeah, I liked yeah. that. Um, that yeah. reminds me about when he was like, like we, when we were children, do you remember when you were children, or you were not really bothered about the, the magazine or the comic or whatever, you just wanted a free little <laughs> toy or something. That went with it, didn't you? Like Kinder Surprises. <laughs> like the Kinder Eggs, yeah. They can't get Kinder Eggs in the States. How can you know? I think they're illegal. But let's like, like yeah, I'll, I'll explain later. <clears throat> anyway, so who who first made these quilts? So this is the bear paw. 
So as you can see from the history, it's not possible to know which area of the country or which cultural group first made quilts using this block. In addition, it is it has been popular with all cultures, including African Americans. The recent stories include the Bear Paw as having been used as part of the Underground Railroads. This makes a wonderful tale of how the Bear Paw quilt signaled escaping slaves that they that they needed to follow the tracks. Oh, that's cute. I like that. Mm. Perhaps to find water or shelter, we need to realise that there's no evidence that quilts were made during the Underground Railroad, yet at the same time understand how these stories honour the, the brave people who escaped slavery and those who helped them. I know that's so, it's nice. I think it's interesting. But people back then did that. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, let's see if I've got one more time. I don't know. Do we have time for one more or not? I don't know. What do you reckon? You, you told me not to go any over an hour and it's 55 minutes right now. <laughs> My mum said, don't go over an hour. <laughs> <laughs> let's do one more quick one just because I feel like it. And I don't want to listen to my mum. <laughs> Enough to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so the hexagon honeycomb and the grandmother's flower garden. You see that one, Mum? Like all hexagons. Yeah, quite, this is quite a nice one, actually. You like this one? I'm surprised yeah, you don't yeah, think yeah. of it as like fuddy duddy. I think it's a bit more interesting than the other ones. I like how they've done the border. Did I take a photograph of the border? Because it's kind of like... Um... I'm sorry, but the biscuit one looks a bit... I don't know. I, I'm not really keen on that biscuit one at all. <laughs> I don't know. And the Bears Paw one, or whatever whatever you want to call it, I don't know. But it's a struck on it for some reason. There's a bit more detail in this one. So... One of the best loved vintage quilts is the Grandmother's Flower Garden. These hexagon quilts of bright pastel prints can be found in antique shops, flea markets and attics, but very few new ones are made. There is a good reason for this. This is a very labour intensive quilt pattern, usually pieced and, hand, and quilted by hand, because I think I've got a funny feeling they need to be English paper pieced. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Mm. So the twentieth. So this is something that you could probably like. You could start and you just work on it over time. Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe we should do it. We could do that together. You could do some. Um, we could do this together. You could yeah. do some like take some fabrics with you and like do the you know hexagon. And I can do some hexagons. Um, so the 20th century Grandmother's Flower Garden. Grandmother's Flower Garden quilts bring to mind the Great Depression of the 1930s. We can imagine our own gra grandmothers busily sewing together one of these lovely quilts using scraps from her scrap basket. Such a quilt would be a cheerful reminder of colourful flower gardens, a much needed lift during hard times. <clears throat> This pattern had become very popular during the 1920s and continues to be a favourite for many years. See, we should have done this during quarantine. Yeah. A grandmother's flower garden. Mm. It sounds nice, I don't think it sounds really cute, that. Like the flower garden. <laughs> Your grandmother's flower garden, yeah. <laughs> Not just a flower garden, it has to be grandma's. <laughs> yeah, grandma's. So this piece hexagon quilt was, had roots in England as far back as the 18th century. Emigrants soon brought this pattern to America. Hexagon templates for this quilt have been found that were made around 1770. This leads historians to believe that the hexagon pattern might be one of the oldest pieced patterns. The earliest known American made hexagon pattern is dated 1807 while an English hexagon quilt is dated even earlier. It's likely that they made 
that they were made for years before that time as quilts of this era weren't often were often not dated and few of the quilts made this early have survived to be enjoyed today. So the 19th century, high skin quilts were known as mosaic quilts, honeycomb quilts, or side, six-sided patchwork. So Barbara Brackman tells us the design sustained its popularity across the decades, changing from chits to silk to wool to calicos, first in brown here we go. First in brown cottons. <laughs> you don't like your brown quilts, do you? <clears throat> no. Then greys and then pastels. It needs to be done. If it's a flower, God, you don't want it to be brown. I know what the heck is all that about. I have no idea. <clears throat> so, Goody's Ladies Book founded in 1830, published a hexagon pattern in 1835. It was thought to be the first piece of quilt pattern published in America. All things English were emulated by cultured American women during... What does cultured American women mean? Why do they have to be cultured to make a hexagon quilt? Um, during this period of making hexagon quilts were, was very popular in England. The article became, perhaps there is not, perhaps there is not patchwork that is prettier or more ingenious than the hexagon or six-sided. This is also called honeycomb patchwork. The way the hexagons were arranged changed over the years. In her book that was published in 1929, Ruth Finlay stated the, the honeycomb also, a one patch quilt was made of hexagon patches sewed together without any attempt at colour arrangement. But these six sided patches were too suggestive of design not to invite experiment at the hand of the colour loving woman who worked with them. Even the oldest tattered remnants of hexagon quilts show attempts of, at sorting and arrangement of colours. In time, various, various more or less elaborate mosaic patterns resulted. So by the 20th century, hexagon quilts were usually made in the grandmother's flower garden pattern. These contained a centre hexagon circled by six colourful printed or solid hexagons with another row of 12 hexagons around them. The centres were sometimes yellow to represent the flower centre. Between each flower was a row of coloured solid hexagons to represent the background. A green background might have been the garden while white could have been a white picket fence. Aww. Oh. Aww. <laughs> So how English paper piecing is done, during the 19th century, high skin quilts were made using the English paper piece method. With this method, a hexagon template had to be cut out of paper or light cardboard for each hexagon patch. Have you tried English paper piecing, Mum? No. I struggle with it. And I, haven't, I think I need to find a better tutorial to help me with it. So basically, like, you... I've still not know anybody done any of that kind of thing. Has anybody done any English paper piece then? Let me know. So basically, and do you, do you have success with it? So basically, you get a piece of paper, like you can get them free in magazines. <laughs> but the free ones mm -hmm. in the magazines, I find the paper to be too papery. I know that sounds stupid. But um, thing. I prefer to do English paper piecing with like a piece of cardstock. Do you know, like a thicker piece of paper? Because you've got to fold. So you basically get a hexagon, like say you've got a hexagon that's like four inches, then you get a piece of fabric that's five inches, and then you fold it over the paper. Yeah? Do you create right. a nice sharp looking hexagon? And then on that back side where you fold them all over, you sew all the corners down with your needle and thread. Do you know, to keep the shape in? And then you take the paper out. So the paper's only there in order to create the shape of the hexagon. 
So you like you you finger press it, yeah. So you create the hexagon shape wow. out of the fabric. And then what you do after that is you have loads of hexagons, like you'll press them or whatever with your iron, and then you like sew them together. Now that's the trouble that I have with my English paper piece in. When I try and sew my hexagons together and I flip them back over, sometimes I can see my stitches. And I don't do it on the sewing machine, I do hand stitch the paper piece in, but I can still see it when I come. So I maybe that is what I need to do. I've just had a thought. Molyfilament wow. thread. Do you know the invisible thread? Do you use monofilament, maybe? It just bothers me that I can see the stitches when I've sewn them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would me as well. So Roberta says, yes, English paper piece is very time consuming. I use cardstock instead of paper, say. And I actually have a, I know I shouldn't really say this because I'm baby luck, but I do have a scanning cut, which is rubber. And I can cut all these, um, all the, you know, the papers out myself, like with my scanning cut. So that, I, I don't have to buy the hexagons from a quilt shop. I can actually do it myself. So yeah. <clears throat> there's something I really want to do. I really want to do like English paper pieces, but every time I tried it, it just, it just doesn't, I don't like the look of it. So I don't know if I just need to practice more and you get better. Or we'll something... do it on you. you do it on your scraps. You know, because you've got loads of scraps, don't you? I do do it on my scraps. I do. So, what else? Is... Maybe you should do mm. something small. <laughs> Not like really teeny tiny ones, could you imagine? <clears throat> well, do it, just do something like um, a face mat size, you know, just do it something like that, do it to practice. Have I read this part? So during the 19th century, hexagon quills were made using English paper piece and method. This, with this method, a hexagon template can be cut out of paper or lightweight cardboard for each hexagon patch. If the quilt maker was very careful after she finished sewing them together, she might be able to take some of these hexagon templates out to be used another time. Other quilters left the templates in, giving us the opportunity to date some of these quilts by the piece of newspaper left in the quilt. How about that? Oh, what about when you wash it? I don't know. Did they wash it? I'm guessing, oh, they probably didn't wash it. <laughs> Unless it got, when they did wash it, like the, the ink stamped onto the back of it. I don't know, but I like that kind of thing. <laughs> Hang on a minute, don't forget you are of that era when you used to buy fish and chips from the chip shop and they wrapped your fish and chips up in newspaper. Do you not remember that? Yeah, but they, were, they had um, a, what, something inside it. They had, you, yeah, you did used to do that, but you had, um, <laughs> what do you call it? It's like that parchment paper something first. There was a piece of paper in thingy, then they used to wrap it up in newspaper. It wasn't just put into a newspaper. I know, but when you got home, the newspaper was kind of soggy, so that print, that ink could have got into your chips no, when you think about the it. The piece of paper, the, <clears throat> the other piece of paper was quite thick paper, wasn't okay. it? Okay. So mosaic paper piecing was done using other shapes as well, includes triangles, diamonds, and just about any shape that could be fit together. Sometimes these quilts are called one patch quilts as there is only one shape used throughout the quilt. You can visualize this better if I describe the process of English paper piecing to you. So once the template is are prepared, a piece of fabric can then be cut so there would be about a quarter of an inch showing all around the template. So I kind of like to do a bit more than quarter of an inch. I think quarter of an inch is a little bit too small, but I think it's personal preference. So the extending fabric is then folded over the template and basted down. So sometimes people will use like glue to baste it or some people will use um, thread. Now I'm wondering, is glue better? Is glue better option than it is to use thread to English paper piece? I'm gonna throw it out there. And finally, 
each of the hexagon pieces is whip stitched together from the back side. So is that my problem? Is that I don't know how to do whip stitch properly? What's that? What's a whip stitch? <clears throat> yeah. Um, let me have a look. I'm just going to throw just videos. A whip stitch is a simple sewing stitch that is used in crochet and knitting and sewing and it is which the needle is passed in and out of the fabric and serves as stitches that circle an edge of the fabric. It is similar to a blanket stitch as it is a form of hand sewing stitch that helps to finish edges. So a whip stitch is basically a blanket stitch. <clears throat> that may be why I'm going wrong. Maybe I'm using the wrong stitch to stitch them together in the first place. And Roberta says that she uses glue and it takes a lot. It, it takes too long to whip stitch. <laughs> Do you know, like an overlock thing on it because I think that would be quite nice actually. Do you know, like on the front, and like you know, how you do sort of like some kind of a nice fancy um stitch on the top. Oh, I see what you mean, like button them together and just doing a decorative stitch on the top. Yeah, oh, you've given me an idea. <laughs> Try that. <clears throat> yeah, I think you know something like that, or you know, like doing like a thing, like what's called on top of it, free motion on it. No, that's not going to work. Would it not? I think that's going <clears> to <throat> like a nice little uh, fancy stitch on it. I'm almost wondering whether you could do an heirloom stitch on it to lock them well, both yeah, together. You could fancy stitches on it. I don't know, I might try that. I might try that for this week's video. See what happens. Yeah, tell Dylan, what was, what was it then um, you just uh, said that she, what was that whip stitch to do? Have now? you ever tried a decorative stitch on your English paper piece in? Like a heirloom stitch where it's like going over the two pieces? I'm going to try that. I guess if you don't see a video this week, I wasn't very successful. <laughs> <laughs> um, the book advertises to buy their paper products just get a template oh wait a minute I think I missed something Lucy Boston patchwork of the crosses is a good pattern thank you I'm going to have to look into that yeah, Roberta says she just based she based it together instead of whip stitching it. All right. <clears throat> so the resulting stitches were slightly smaller and tighter than a quilt made with running stitches would be. See, and I think that's what I do. I use running stitches to do mine together, and I don't like the look of it. Would you top that? To top that off, the hexagons used in the 19th century were usually smaller than those used for the later grandmother's flower garden. Some of these early honeycomb quilts were made up of hexagons as small as one inch or even half an inch. Half inch hexagons. That's a bit too. You said go small. Mm. That would look that would make a nice rug, wouldn't it? So how grandmother's flower garden quilts are made or were made, this is not to diminish the work that went into a 20th century grandmother's flower garden. During the first decades of the 20th century, most quilt makers aspired to make at least one grandmother's flower garden quilt. 
So this must be a walk of like, what, what is a bucket list? It's a bucket list item for a quilter by the sound of it. You've got to make one, at least one flower garden in your lifetime. Maybe. <laughs> These quilts may have been made up of slightly larger hexagons and were more often sewn together with a running stitch, but finishing one was still a major accomplishment. Add to that the fact that the binding often followed the lines of the hexagon results in an interesting but also more difficult binding. The border in the picture shown in this section is delightful in its use of multiple rows of hexagons for the border. Note how the quilts are sometimes substituted other colours in a row, possibly because she was running out of fabric in some colours. <laughs> <laughs> Grandmother's flower garden quilts were often quilted about a quarter of an inch on each side of the seam lines. Using the quilting, usually the quilting was all done with white or off-white thread. And then, although using hexagons and other mosaics in quilts today is uncommon, some, sorry, let me say that again. Although using hexagons and other mosaics in quilts today is uncommon, some quilt artists are making mosaic quilts using traditional in English paper, paper piecing. The result can be truly stunning, as can be seen in this French-made hexagon quilt. There we go. I have done, well it wasn't even me, I read, <laughs> I read from the womenfolk.com on these three different quilt blocks. That was kind of interesting. Well, it is, isn't it? I wonder who started off this, how somebody just ended up doing some, do you know what I mean? How does somebody think about, oh my God, I'm going to just put all these things together and make something out of it. I'm assuming that they probably just sewed and mended the clothes like way back when and then somebody just decided just to, I don't know. Maybe they just didn't have a blanket and they just wanted to make a quilt or something for the bed. I, I, I thought I heard some, well, read or heard somewhere that people start to use to make these these uh, quilts and things out of the um, old clothes to keep themselves warm. No, but I think that's a myth because I think somebody had busted that myth. I wonder if there's oh, something wow. on here about that. Um... I'm just saying they've got some myths on here. I wonder if they've actually got some about that. Um, would it go under women of the past use scraps for quilts as a frugal measure? It's early well, oh early well. So there's so in the same website, women folk, they've got myth number five: women of the past use scraps. For quilting as a frugal measure and they put although some quilters use scraps from clothing in their quilts others bought fabric specifically for quilts they made other times quilts were made with a combination of both <clears throat> so although imaginative law spinners claim that patchwork quilts themselves are made with worn out cloth it is typically the good pieces not the worn they were cut and stitched into patchwork. It would be counterproductive to spend time sewing fabric that was already worn out. Of course, scraps left over making garments were used in scrap quilts, much as we use leftover scraps from our quilting projects to get today when we want a scrappy look. 
um, the frugality theory also implies that quilt making was a necessary drudgery. Instead, we find that most women enjoy the creativity involved in making a quilt, whether with new fabric or scraps. Although quick and simple, quilts were made for everyday use. Many quilts were far too intricate in the piecing and quilting to have been made just for necessity. This is not to say that women never use scraps to make a quilt in order to save money or to get by because they had no money to spend on fabric. Women did use scraps left over from making clothing. They also made quilts using feed sacks during the years. They, they were available. But the frugal quilter myth implies that most, if not all, quilting was done out of need to make something frugally. There you go. So I guess I'm going to pick this up next week because I've got a few more quilt blocks I want to discuss about because this was kind of fun. Yeah. But for today, we are going to call it a day. Because I want to go to Lowe's. <laughs> Well, I'm going to do my garden stuff and I'm hoping it stops raining because the sun looks like it's coming out at last it's summer it was summer solstice yesterday it was the longest day oh that was it yeah it's the longest day of the year yesterday and now we're going back to shorter hours oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and on that note I'm going to say Goodbye. Oh, wait a minute. Goodbye. Better check. Better check. <laughs> no, there's nothing else. Thank you guys for your comments. Thank you so much for being with us today. I very much appreciate your time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.